Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for warming to the stage. I've, that was good to keep everyone ready for five minutes. So the, like the goal of today's session is kind of to share with you how we do intelligence-driven instant response and threat hunting at Mangent. Um, I think that today most of the organization that have got basic and like fundamental security stack, they've got EDR deployed, they collect logs, probably not all the logs, but they've got like a SIM, for example, to start doing some role detection, should apply that, have the capability to develop that in-house. So there's no magic, I'm not going to share any magic, I'm just going to share today some simple processes that we use to find Avial, sometimes to find APT, or just simply additional new malware or new technique uh, in the wild. When I started at Mangent three and a half years ago, I was part of the incident response team, and probably a month in, I started to do some compromise assessment. So I started to work on a compromise assessment, and another colleagues as well on another compromise assessment. And for the two for the two environments, we found APG group into um, the client environment. Then at that stage, I was a bit scared. I was like, can we really find APT into every organization? We found another IR, and during the IR, we investigating a ransomware incident. That was just a few months after that. And we've identified through TTP's IOC, I'm going to share that today, we identified APT39 that's been in that client network for more than five years. Luckily, after that, we find we did few compromise assessments and other ransomware cases. I was like, okay, cool. APT are not everywhere. But it is way and tactic and technique that we can use to identify not only APT, but just additional pieces of evidence, additional malware within the environment, by just following a simple process and codifying uh, intelligence. So just a few words about myself. I'm Silva Hirsch. I used to do incident response at Credit Suisse, based in Zurich after a master degree in cyber security. Then I moved to Singapore, now I'm based out of Singapore. I've been part of Mandian for three years plus, did incident response first. After that, I got a bit bored to do a long weekend working on ransomware, so I decided to, to try to explore something else. So now I'm doing cyber security strategy, helping organization to enhance the detection capabilities and also their readiness. Just a borrowing slide in terms of just disclosure. Um, at the end of the presentation, there's some real example from cases, and sadly, I had to redact uh, some of the IOCs because some of them are unknown, and some of them could link to our client's um, investigation. But it won't change any of the findings. How do we identify APT? How do we identify additional pieces of malware or like threat actors activity in our client network when we do incident response. And I've realized that it was probably three principles that every organization should apply, either proactively to do like proactive threat hunting and not waiting for the incident response, or they could also apply kind of the same methodology after being breached and starting the investigation. And the three principles are having a well-standardized incident response process. Honestly, the analysis is probably the easiest part. I think the hardest part that most organizations uh, struggle with is the data collection and the data processing in order to be able to provide the analyst uh, all the logs to start the investigation. If the data collection and the data processing is done in a good manner and a repeatable manner, the analyst kind of just follow like a process, use his knowledge to find additional pieces of evidence and we will go through that today. Secondly, we need actionable intelligence. I think today most organizations are very good at using atomic IOCs, like hash value, IP address, domain name. I mean, there's so many red teamers in the, in the room. You know that you probably change you, like your infrastructure or just spin up your environment in the clouds. Um, I mean, for every engagement. Um, but how can we codify threat access CTPs to find patterns and to be able to find additional malware that, that are unknown, just by codifying the TTPs that we've seen from the past. So we're going to deep dive into that. And the last thing, which is kind of always boring, but very necessary, is just to get the right methodology and to follow a right process. So let's deep dive into intelligence uh, incident response first. Just to start and set the stage, what's in, what is intelligence? Like, intelligence is an evidence-based knowledge of threat actors. It could be linked to a single event, a serif event, but 
It's basically just the modus operandi of threat actors. And honestly, after working on several ransomware cases, ransomware cases are pretty boring. I don't know if you're even investigating a ransomware incident. They always, the threat actors always use the same TTPs. There's like the last, the 10, like the five favorite TTPs per stage of the attack. And they always use the same. There is a way to quickly identify that before the threat actors is able to deploy as ransomware. Um, but just deep dive, if that works, just before deep diving into like intelligence, I just want to share some insight into how do we do instant response at men and how we've done it. And I think everyone can do it as well. The first thing we often being called, I mean, as a consultancy company, we often being called um, after the incident or after some evidence of malicious activities have occurred in the network. So we've got some hints. We've got some what I call incident response IOCs. We got a malware name, a malware hash value. We got maybe a threat actor staging directory where the threat actors store his, uh, store his uh, utilities or collected data uh, before exfiltration. So we've got that incident uh, response um, a known beta IOC, IR, uh, KB IOCs, that we will use to swap the entire environment. That will allow us to identify every system with that piece of uh, like evidence. It doesn't have to be a malware, it could just be even um, just a directory uh, or just a file name, doesn't matter. We will be able to identify every endpoint with that specific um, pieces of, of evidences. Then, we will deep dive into that. So the first thing we're going to, to start to do is a timeline analysis. We've got whatever, for example, a malware that has been written on this at that time. We will use that as a pivot point and look what happened before, look what happened after. Usually we're able to understand how the attackers move in, move out, what kind of, like, what kind of action is performed on the, on the endpoint at that stage. Did he deploy a new malware? Did he manage to escalate privileges? Did he move laterally to other endpoints? And that will, help us to find additional pieces of, of evidence, additional evidence of malicious activities that we will use then to sweep the environment again. Just before moving to that iterative process, when we've identified a compromised system, we also apply TTPs IOCs. So we've codified tactic and technique that we've seen across multiple um, incidents to kind of spot additional unknown. So right now when we do timeline analysis, we kind of mainly leverage uh, time proximity. However, if we need to find an incident that occur like maybe after, like if the threat actors deleted logs and we couldn't see that, for example, we will deploy TTP's IOCs to find unrelated evidences to that specific time. And we will deep dive into TTP's IOC at the end of that presentation. So once we've finish our analysis of our, of our endpoints, we potentially have more IOCs and we will sweep the environment again and that's lead us to that iterative process between swiping, deep diving, swiping, deep diving. We can do that for several days, several weeks, depending on the size of the incident. But the goal of it is really to understand the full extent of the activity and to answer uh, the investigation key question. So really the purpose of the incident response is not to find I mean, it's to, to scope fully the incident um, and probably won't find like every small element that happened on one endpoint. The purpose is really to understand what happened on the entire environment, how the threat actors got into the environment, what's the root cause of it, what's the scope of the incident, how many endpoints have been compromised, what type of malware has been used, what type of compromised account has been used, etc. And really the overall purpose is really to determine the scope the root cause, um, the earlier days of compromise, either it is still, the attack is still going on, to know if the threat actors managed to exfiltrate some data or got access to critical uh, data. But also we've got everything related, related to threat actors' identification uh, and attribution. If we know which threat actors we're dealing with, we're really empowered to apply specific IOCs and specific TTPs that we've seen from that specific threat actors. And that's literally speed up the entire investigation. One day I was working on a case and we found a piece of malware um, that was related to APD39. And my AP analyst provided me all the IOCs that we got for APD39. Obviously, some of them would have created a lot of false positive. 
But because that environment has been compromised by APD49, it really enabled us to quickly spot additional pieces of evidence and to speed up the entire, the entire investigation. So that threat actor's attribution is really key to understand the motive of and also the TTPs being used by the threat actors. And all of that information will really help us to move to the eradication phase and then to improve the network. But how do we really find Avial? Um, as I said, we will use that intelligent, that knowledge on threat actors, TTPs. And I think these three key parts of intelligence, it has to be accurate, otherwise it will mislead the investigation. Um, it has to be timely. Obviously, if we are not aware of a new technique, for example, um, it will be more difficult to find it. So we will need to find, to get timely intelligence, to get input from the red teamers, for example, which are often very valuable, and to make it actionable. I think the hardest part is there's a lot of people, a lot of organizations that tend to do threat hunting or to leverage that, like that IOCs, that intelligence, but they haven't codified the TTP is in a matter to be able to be scalable and actionable um, across investigation or just in a proactive manner. I mean, you're probably all aware of the pyramid of pain. Um, like from a threat actor's perspective, it is very easy to change hash value, domain name, IP address. That's where we're going to really tend to focus on TTPs, IOCs, to find new pieces of malicious activities which are unknown. And I always like to just reiterate the fact that an IOC is, is a host or network-based artifact of compromise. Sometimes organizations forget that if the threat actors use PSExec to conduct his malicious activity to deploy malware, for example, that pieces of evidence has to be leveraged for the investigation. If PSExec is being used across the environment by admin, it will be probably more difficult to understand um, what's legit and not, but with the account being compromised, etc., in the timeline of activity, will probably be easier. So an IOC is not only a malicious element or like malicious utility, it could also be legitimate utility being used by the threat actors. So threat hunting, it's really the proactive process to use intelligence in order to identify previous compromise or ongoing, um, ongoing compromise. And we need, we need to hunt for um, for threat actors that are bypassed our control. At that stage, we kind of expect that our control work pretty well, but anyway, the threat actors and like all the red teamers bypass CDR all the time. So what kind of flocks can we leverage and where can we manage to, to, to identify the threat actor? Um, we need to have a flexible, scalable, and repeatable process just to make sure we can repeat, re repeat that threat hunt every three months, for example, for specific TTPs. And if you want, and I will say there's really two scenarios. I will discuss both of them, but I'm mainly going to focus on the first one, which is doing kind of a threat hunting, finding additional pieces of evidence, doing an incident response engagement. So doing an incident engagement, what type of IOCs do we have? What kind of IOCs can we leverage? I think the first one, as I mentioned, is the known by IOCs. Like, basically, that's the input of our investigation. Pretty easy. The second one that we can still use, but we will mainly find commodity malwares, even if we cannot find, we could potentially find some utility or some pieces of um, evidence relative to the ongoing attack, is everything known as atomic IOCs. Something that we, these two points I really wanted to discuss today is that TTPs IOCs is all these IOCs that has been codified. So it could be known misuse staging directories by threat actors. Tent threat actors tend to be super lazy, to be honest. They always name, this, well, not always, they often name their utility with a very short name. So if you look for, if you look for short binary, short executable in the most common Windows binary, such recycle bin, public, etc. For two or three executable, like name executable, I will tell you, it will be pretty easy to triage. And obviously you might find a, a, any, anyone in the organization could name a file pp.exe. 
So potentially it's just malicious, just a test from a user. But it could also be related. So it's pretty easy to triage. There's not that many utilities in your environment if you just scan it with two or three uh, characters. If you start doing whitelisting, you might miss some stuff, but you might speed up your process. So we'll discuss about how we can codify it, um, that TTPs. And the last point is really to find unknown is by doing stacking. So by doing stacking, we're going to collect specific artifacts across the environment. So for example, we'll collect all the services across the environment to find outliers. I mean, across your Windows servers, most of the services should be plus minus the same, especially if you manage to set up a baseline, it's pretty easy to spot outliers. So by doing stacking, we often find uh, pieces of malicious activities, new type of malware, new type of technique being used by threat actors. So a quick example, how can we find Evil? I mean, just very, very basics. Um, we've got an instant response engagement. We've got a malware one and few TTPs, threat actors compromise credential, etc. It's pretty easy to, to, to sweep all the environment, identify all the system with that known malware. But how can we find that malware number two? That malware number two, is somehow related to the investigation. We can easily spot it by investigating that system, which is um, SQL, um, and we will see a, an evidence of lateral normal activity out to that specific system. So then we will move to that system, and normally the timeline activity of that system will highlight the, um, the malware too. However, the malware tree, which is potentially unrelated to that, these two techniques, the first one is really to sweep the environment and to look for outliers, or to really scan the environment for um, our TTP, our EC sweep, as we call them, for example, to look for all the short time binary, or to look for all weird like service, uh, sorry, task, uh, task name across the environment, and that may enable us to find additional pieces of evidence unrelated to the incident. So if we move, if we move to the theory, like for actually, if we move to the practice, one simple example is like harm for malicious services. I mean, we all know why, what's a malicious services is just running in the background, etc. but threat actors love Malicious, like love using services to keep personalities, to do malicious movement activity, and to escalate privileges. And what we see is like this is the five most uh, frequently seen uh, sub technique based on mentioned uh, last year investigation. So across all our investigation, that's the first, the the five most frequently seen um, technique. And what we see is service execution is basically being seen in 26% of all the investigation. So if you start hunting for malicious services, you might find bad stuff. So how can you really codify and structure that um, TTPs, IOCs, to find malicious services? Then if we just narrow it down to one specific um, type of malware, we all know that Beacon is still very like, actually I don't still know why, but Beacon is still seen quite a while. We see it in 10% of, we've seen it in 10% of all investigation last year. There's a decrease of the usage of Beacon uh, and Cobalt Strike, most probably because most of the EDR are pretty good at detecting uh, Cobalt Strike and all the Beacon uh, activities. Um, and I've done few purple team and, and yeah, I mean, that's a fact right now. Most of like the biggest EDR are pretty good at detecting that. And although we saw a decrease of Beacon, it is still used in kind of 10% of all uh, the, the investigation that we investigated last year. So we can still build use cases. We still see APT Group using it. Don't ask me why. Financially motivated uh, threat actors and also a lot of unclassified threat actors. So how can we identify Cobalt Strike Beacon in the environment? Sorry, the clipper doesn't work very well. Um, so we know if you want to move laterally and deploy another beacon and use it, jump PSExec uh, beacon command, that will create an artifact on the remote endpoint that will create a service name with seven character by default. Obviously, you can change that, but by default, and we still see threat actors, and I won't say 
in that case, probably advanced threat actors, but we'll still see threat actors using the default configuration of Cobalt Strike. So what we can do, we know that there's a service being created on the destination endpoint, and in that case, and in that case, if we looked at uh, Windows System Event Logs 7045, we can look for a system name with a seven character uh, name and that specific path. So we can codify it and then use it across all our investigation or just across one hunt uh, mission. Let's move on. Something that we, we, need, we need to try to understand and we need to always think as blue teamers is red teamers always evolve. For example, just in that case, if we just look at the new version of Cobalt Strike, since, for example, Cobalt Strike uh, thing is 4.1, the new the service name has changed. Instead of that local IP address, we've got the system destination IP address. So if we just rely on a previous TTPs IOCs, we won't find much activities. So that's why we always tend to try to understand how threat actors evolve, how red teamers evolve, to kind of slowly trick and modify I TTPs IOCs to find evil, otherwise we will miss that. However, I mean that was a super simple example into how we could just codify IOCs that could be extended to basically all the TTPs. But something that I've started to that I've started to notice is I was working in a bank previously and we had so much logs, but we're not doing anything with these logs, kind of. And by looking across the environment and doing that static technique, we can really quickly identify some quick win, really also better understand the environment, and that will also speed up the investigation uh, if we're getting hit by instant response. So if, so if we want to do like stacking to really identify outliers, like we will collect, for example, in that case, all the services across the environment. And we've done that during one of our compromise assessments. Um, in that compromise assessment, based on the industry uh, vertical and the geo like the location of the um, organization we work for, we kind of suspected APD41 to be in the network. However, at that stage, we didn't find like any evidences of compromise. And by analyzing all the services and by finding outliers in the services, we managed to find actually APD41. I'm just going to show you how. So we collected all the services, we stacked them, and obviously we start to look for outliers. We start to look for outliers for services that are basically OQ1, two, three, or four times in, in the system. If we don't find more, we can look for a bit like more of that. And then it's simple like basic analysis and triage. So I just had to redact it, uh, redact that service name. But look at that service name and just start to do some, some basic triage activity. First thing that any instant responder will do is just to Google it. In that case, the system looked pretty legit. There's like 30,000 plus results. It's, there's information about the DLL link to that services. Uh, it seems to be a default um, Windows 10 service. At that stage, we could like move on. I mean, that's also the difficulty is like at one point, do we continue to deep, to deep dive deeper or we continue like deep diving into that specific artifact? In that case, one of my colleagues continued to dive deeper and identified that the like DLA link to that services was not the same one that what he saw on, uh, on Google. So then it's just a quick search. That's why I said to like all the students when I teach, Google is your best friend. If you got plenty of results and you see it's legit, it's a good way to say it's legit. When you start Googling something, a DLA linked to a supposed known services and there's no result, that's a big no-no. So that DLL was heavily obfuscated and it ended up being um, a, like a backdoor being used by APE41. However, as I said, like threat actors evolve. And if we stay with the example of um, services and malicious services, most of the organization rely on two types of like uh, evidences and event logs. They will rely on this, the Windows system event logs 7045 or the security event logs 4697 to find new services being created. And last year I was running a purple team with, with one of my red teamers and we tested 
a bunch of technique to create new services and to move laterally. And then he started to use a new technique called uh, SCL. I was not aware of that technique at the time. I had no idea. And I just, he just told me, yeah, I just managed to uh, run my, my malware through that service. And I couldn't find any evidence of that activity. Like, I had no visibility. And then I just started to research a bit, and I realized that SC Shell was not creating a new services. It was simply modifying the binary file path in uh, the services. So it was just opening remotely the services, changing the binary file path, running the executable, and then reverting the original file path. So if we deep dive into any new services being created, we won't find anything. That's where I think we need to constantly improve. Um, and in that case, I just find two uh, pieces of like evidence related to that activity. Um, they were actually not logged in my client environment. I mean, uh, Windows registry being modified will probably be way too, like, will create a massive quantity of log, which will be pretty challenging to collect from a price perspective. So we just need to understand, can we detect that? Maybe we can't. If we can't, I mean, at least we know where we've got to gather visibility. If we identified one day a malware being run through a services, but don't, we don't understand because there's that gap of lag, at least we know that there's a way to bypass that. Um, and how do we leverage that TTPIOC? And I was amazed by seeing APT group kind of being a bit lazy somehow. So even if they were find vulnerability on device, on new device at edge, for example, new like um, vulnerability as we see with like Chinese redactors compromising so many um, like firewall, etc. When they compromise the network, when they move into the network, honestly, they tend to be lazy somehow. And doing compromise assessment for that organization that I mentioned before, uh, we suspect AB41 to be in the network. But we couldn't find much at the beginning. And one way we managed to find them is by just simply looking for small binary and for file name. And something which was pretty interesting with the first redacted file path is basically the directory where all like the admins, so all the utilities used for admin purposes. Um, and what we've seen with the redactors looking the environment, dropping his malware there. Um, actually, there was not a malware, there was a, like a legitimate utility used to dump uh, credential, and he just rename it with a, with a different name, and we spot it, we spot it like that. Uh, he modified the hash value, that's why the hash value was unknown. Um, and then he used just a normal Windows directory um, like pretty common to drop all the outputs of his reconnaissance activity. And it was kind of somehow pretty easy to like to identify just because they use short binary and short file name. And there's another example of that, that the example of APD49 that was identified in the client environment um, during that ransomware incident. So during that ransomware incident, we're just deep diving and we got lucky because one of the systems impacted by the ransomware had evidences of APD39 activity. And by applying that TTP's IOCs, by looking at um, weird executable in some specific directories, by looking at specific services or specific tasks on that system, that leads us to some uh, unusual executable in that Windows security folder. And for example, we, I didn't really understand first why ps.exe um, uh, PS, PS.exe is PSExec in that case, um, but I couldn't really understand why it was being renamed. And apparently that's a train up with uh, APD49. Afterwards, we knew that. Um, and one of the, um, the malware identified that has been renamed, short, short file name, was also found in that, was basically uh, SSH Tunneler. And we found evidence, thanks to some logs, evidence of activity in 2017, which was like seven years, like five years ago before the investigation. So, um, 
And on top of that, I think it's just that's where when we find additional like piece of evidence where we start deep diving again with that uh, iterative process. And I think just the key takeaway for today, I think it's just important to get that assume bridge mindset. Also, threat actors like constantly innovate. There is so many of the tactic and technique that are currently known. Most of them can be codified using and most of them can be codified, or for most of them, threat hunt mission can be created. Um, and we can find them before they compromise your organization. And so we really know how they operate. And sometimes I work with organizations that try to find a specific technique in the system, uh, in the environment, and to create a, like a mission, like a, like a hunt for that specific uh, TTPs, which is never seen. And that's why I always recommend look at the main TTPs that are being used, start to do some hunts for them. And when you get a good, like, good foundation, then you can look for more tricky TTPs. Um, again, let's try to aim for that TTPs IOCs and not focus just on atomic IOCs. Make a repeatable and scalable as well as measurable process. And we need to start somewhere, so obviously it is hard to have hunt mission across the attack, uh, the meta attack framework. But look first for the quick wins, create like mission hunt for that. You can repeat them, that's why it's good to know exactly which technique you can detect into environment where you got uh, log missing as well. And organizations should, organization should know better the environment than anyone. They should know better the environment than threat actors. They should know where they got a gap of, gap of visibility. Um, so after designing that threat hunting process and capabilities, just making sure they got the right logs, and by leveraging intelligence, that's why they, they really need to understand the environment, what's the cron jewel, what's the gap in visibility that they have, and what kind of logs do they have. And I was discussing with, with one of the participants today, yesterday about, um, Purple team. And in my opinion, doing a purple team in your organization is probably one of the biggest win because you can first check your technology. You can identify, uh, what type of log you're missing. You can identify for all the TTPs what kind of log has been, uh, created. If you got a gap in visibility, if you got a gap in detection logic, or if everything was logged, it was detected, but it was mystery I work with some organization. They great, great logging. The CISO wanted always to constantly improve his logging capability. Was great. We did a purple team for them. They detected almost 90% of all the TTPs, and we, we tested 90 plus technique. Detected 90, um, sorry, almost like all the, like, sorry, they logged almost all the TTPs. Most of them were detected, but the blue teamers never seen evil, never seen malicious activity in its environment and was just unable to identify anything, or very little. And with that said, that's also how you could basically then understand, okay, where is my gap? And in that case, if you realize you just need to train people because you got great visibility, you can train people during a purple team, and then you can use that purple team and that red team activity to, to start um, testing your hunt rules. So just the key takeaways, we know Threat actors will compromise organization. So if you don't start hunting, starting now. And that's it for today. Is there any question? <laughs> Is there any question? Is there any blue teamers in the room? Because I've seen these mainly red teamers. I know there's few of them. Excellent. There's one person, two, three, four, five. Excellent. All right. We've got a few minutes for questions. I mean, if there's no question, we can go for the upper before I will be there as well. Uh, I know there's a break. All right. I mean, I think then we can go for uh, on the terrace for the break. I think it's a bit, it's 10 minutes earlier, but yeah. Thanks everyone for your time today. Have a good day.